Sexual harassment is a very real and sensitive subject in the workplace. In this video, we'll discuss what it means, how to prevent it, and what to do if it does happen. Our company has a zero-tolerance policy regarding sexual harassment. This means that no employee will permit or engage in any conduct which constitutes or is contributory to sexual harassment. The department and its supervisors or managers will take immediate corrective action which may include a disciplinary response to any act which constitutes sexual harassment. Supervisors or managers who fail to respond appropriately may be subject to a disciplinary response. This policy serves as a general notification. For your company's specific sexual harassment policy, please contact your human resources representative. Your employer is committed to providing a workplace free from harassment and discrimination, including unlawful sexual harassment or harassment based on any other characteristic protected by federal, state, and local employment discrimination laws. One of the first things to understand about sexual harassment is that there is no clear definition for the term. The truth is that sexual harassment can have many meanings and take on many different forms. However, it usually applies to requests for sexual favors, unwelcome sexual advances, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature in the workplace. It's an unfortunate state of business today that sexual harassment is present in the workplace. While there have been great advances over the years to reduce the issue, we should not be naive enough to believe it's completely gone away. To fully understand and deal with sexual harassment, we must first understand what it is. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission EEOC, defines sexual harassment as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature which explicitly affects an individual's employment unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Some general characteristics which most sexual harassment situations involve include an employment decision affecting the person being harassed is made because the individual either submitted to or rejected the unwelcome conduct. Unwelcome conduct which unreasonably interferes with the work performance of the person being harassed. Unwelcome conduct which creates or contributes to an intimidating, hostile, or abusive work environment. Certain behaviors such as conditional promotions, awards, training, or other job benefits upon the acceptance of unwelcome actions of a sexual nature by the person being harassed. Women in particular are vulnerable to sexual harassment since they tend to be employed more often in subservient positions with male superiors. In addition, studies indicate that many women are actually reluctant to label their particular experiences as sexual harassment, either because they don't want to rock the boat or because they are not sure that the ordeal qualifies as sexual harassment. However, the truth is that the victim of sexual harassment can be a man or a woman. In addition, both the victim and the perpetrator can be of the same sex. Another fact about sexual harassment, which is not generally known, is that the harasser need not be a supervisor or someone with authority, but can be a coworker, another employee, or a non-employee who has a business relationship with the company, such as a customer or vendor. Harassment in which individuals are asked for sexual favors in exchange for promotions, bonuses, benefits, etc. is called quid pro quo harassment. I think it's time to discuss your career path. Have you thought about where you might be a summer associate? Oh, um, not really. I know it's very competitive. Well, you know what competition's really about, don't you? It's about ferocity, carnage, balancing human intelligence with animal diligence, mm -hmm. knowing exactly what you want and how far you'll go to get it. Are you hitting on me? You're a beautiful girl. <laughs> so everything you just said? I'm a man who knows what he wants. And I'm a law student who just realized her professor is a pathetic asshole. 
Too bad, I thought you were a law student who wanted to be a lawyer. It should be noted that the following actions, depending upon the circumstances, may in and of themselves constitute sexual harassment or at the very least contribute to a hostile work environment. Sexual pranks or repeated sexual teasing, jokes or innuendo in person or via email. Inquiries regarding the sexual experience of an employee slash coworker. Joking or teasing with a sexual nature, touching or grabbing of a sexual nature giving gifts or leaving objects that are sexually suggestive, verbal abuse of a sexual nature, repeatedly making sexually suggestive gestures, repeatedly standing too close to or brushing up against a person, repeatedly asking someone to socialize during off-duty hours when the person in question has said no or has indicated he or she is not interested, making or posting sexually demeaning or offensive pictures, cartoons, or other materials in the workplace. Off-duty, unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, which could potentially affect the working environment. Forced sexual intercourse. Witnesses and bystanders. While the laws and policies are clear and attempt to help victims of sexual harassment, there's not much said about other ways people can help the victims of harassment. Who is a bystander? Bystanders are individuals who observe sexual harassment or conditions that perpetuate harassment. They are not directly involved, but have the choice to intervene, speak up, or do something about it. It is someone who is present and thus potentially in a position to discourage, prevent, or interrupt an incident. What is bystander intervention? Bystander intervention is the act of feeling empowered and equipped with the knowledge and skills to effectively assist in the prevention of sexual harassment. Someone who sees a situation but may or may not know what to do, may think others will act or may be afraid to do something. There is no single right way to intervene, and what is appropriate depends on the situation and the individuals involved. Here are some steps you can take to be an engaged bystander when witnessing sexual harassment. Stare. If you see something going down that looks wrong, just stand there and stare. Make it clear that you are watching. Often the harasser will glare at you, but he or she usually will not persist in the behavior in front of an attentive witness. Create a distraction. Do what you can to interrupt the situation. A distraction can stop the harassing behavior, such as by loudly dropping a book or asking the victim to come to the conference room. Talk to the harasser. Observers can talk to the harasser later by asking questions but not lobbying accusations. Were you aware of how you came off in that conversation? Talk to colleagues. Talk openly about inappropriate behavior, like asking colleagues, did you notice that? Am I the only one who sees it this way? Talk to the target of harassment. One crucial element is for bystanders to talk to targets of harassment. They often feel isolated, and observers might not know if they thought the interaction was consensual or amusing. Colleagues could say, I noticed that happened. Are you okay with that? If not, they could offer to accompany the victim to the Human Resources Department. These are just some examples of bystander intervention. No tactic will work all the time but finding and implementing the right bystander intervention program can help. An attitude of mutual responsibility and a willingness to confront bad behavior are powerful tools for changing a culture and making workplaces safer and kinder. Sexual harassment in the hospitality industry. Although sexual harassment can potentially occur in any working environment and industry, nightclubs, bars, and restaurants tend to see a great many cases. The very culture of these types of businesses seems to facilitate and make it even more possible for individual employees to be treated abusively or with disrespect. Part of this is thought to be because many of these establishments are staffed by women and run by men. In addition, the women who work in the hospitality industry are often forced by the nature of the job to wear tight, skimpy outfits 
and or used their looks to entertain and serve customers, again, most of whom are men. The old school train of thought seems to be that these outfits somehow provoke the harassment. But this is not always the case. And how the victim dresses in no way excuses the perpetrator's actions. The power of subordinate to superior or patron to server is central to understanding how this culture develops and continues. The harassment may be subtle at first, such as a suggestive comment or two. Victims may not even be aware that sexual harassment has occurred, but many merely find themselves uncomfortable with these types of remarks. Studies have shown that the incidences usually escalate, often leaving the employee seeing them as routine or something normal, which must be endured. However, anytime one party interferes with another, or intentionally leaves a victim in an intimidated and or hostile work environment, it constitutes sexual harassment. Here are some examples of the different types of sexual harassment. A. John, a 34-year-old senior analyst in New York City, found that Rita, a colleague who was employed in a comparable position with the company, deliberately touched him with her body and often made suggestive remarks and comments, even though she knew he was happily married. When he complained, he was told that Rita was harmless and that her behavior was simply having fun. B. Janet, a 24-year-old hostess at a cocktail bar, was the frequent target of suggestive remarks, unwelcome sexual advances, and requests for sexual favors from Nick, one of the establishment's best customers. When she complained to management, she was told that it was part of the job and that she should make every effort to make Nick happy so that he would continue to spend money at the establishment. C. Lillian, a secretary in Phoenix, was fondled, groped, and told by her boss that she would go far with the company if she was nice to him. After getting nowhere with complaints to the corporate office, she was forced to resign and seek employment elsewhere. D. Larry, an urban planner for a small Washington municipality, was often subjected to the body and sexual suggestive comments and jokes from his co-workers, both men and women. He was simply too embarrassed to say anything. In other words, sexual harassment can take on many forms and is by no means rare in the workplace, despite media hype that the number of reported cases seems to be decreasing. Further complicating matters is that many incidents of sexual harassment are not intentionally done to target a particular individual, as in the body jokes scenario above. However, if it makes someone feel either humiliated, offended, or both, it definitely qualifies as harassment and should not be tolerated. Coping with sexual harassment in the workplace. Any employee who believes he or she has been the target of sexual harassment or with workplace bullying related to the harassment is encouraged to inform the offending person and the management of the establishment orally or in writing that such conduct is unwelcome, offensive, and must stop immediately. If the employee does not wish to communicate directly with the offending person, or if such communication has proven to be ineffective, or if the harassment escalates, the employee has many avenues in which to report and resolve the situation including contacting law enforcement or filing a lawsuit. It cannot be stated enough that the most ineffective method of dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace is avoidance or denial. Some of the ways to help substantiate a claim of sexual harassment include 1. Make sure every incident is documented, whether it means keeping a journal or using audio video. 2. Tell your story to a friend or coworker. 3. Documenting job performance. Since some harassers retaliate against claims or sexual harassment by firing the employee or denying promotions or awards. Four, check the company's grievance system to see if they have a sexual harassment policy in place. Five, contact a trade union or local civic association which may be able to help. Due in large part to the media coverage of the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings, in the 1990s, many companies have instituted sexual harassment policies to protect not only the employee, but also the company in the event of litigation associated with it. Men and women who are fortunate enough to work for these companies may have some recourse through mediation. 
Mediation is an informal way to resolve office problems using a trained mediator who facilitates communication between all involved parties to the dispute. If an employee chooses to attempt resolution through mediation, management is usually obligated by policy to send a representative to the table. If a resolution is not reached, either party may continue to pursue their rights in any other appropriate forum. A final note on sexual harassment concerns the misconception that women cry sexual harassment every time they are denied a raise or overlooked for a promotion. It is unfortunate that these incidents have occurred, but these cases should in no way interfere with a legitimate complaint. Documenting every incident, however small or trivial, can be a valuable assistance in substantiating or refuting a claim of sexual harassment. Retaliation. Retaliation for purposes of employment law means any type of adverse action taken against an employee that complains about harassment or a witness that participates in an investigation. The EEOC has identified the following actions as retaliatory. Termination, refusal to hire, denial of promotion, threats, negative evaluations that are not justified, negative references that are not justified, increased surveillance or monitoring of the employee, any other action that may prevent a reasonable person from pursuing their rights. Sexual harassment self-test questions. Number one, Kristen is asked by her male boss to stay late to do inventory at the restaurant where she is a hostess. While he is speaking to her, his eyes are totally focused on her body. He never looked at her face. This made her very uncomfortable and she politely but firmly told him she had other plans. Is this sexual harassment? Why or why not? This is a clear case of sexual harassment since the boss was staring at her body and it made her uncomfortable. Number two, Dave is a bartender at a nightclub. His manager, Larry, is constantly coming up behind him and touching him. Although none of the touches are of a sexual nature, they make Dave very uncomfortable. Should he report Larry's behavior to the general manager? Yes, Dave should report Larry's behavior. Touching is never appropriate, and the fact that the touching is constant and makes Dave uncomfortable constitutes a clear case of sexual harassment. Three, Amber is sick of the dirty jokes and inappropriate conversations coming from Ralph, the pharmaceutical sales rep in the next cubicle. Although none of the comments have been directed at her, she finds them offensive and disgusting. What should her next course of action be? Amber should report the behavior to her supervisors first. And if this does not stop the behavior, she should go to the corporate office or owner. Sexual harassment, true or false? Number one, sexual harassment complaints are usually unjustified. False. Number two, women in executive positions are not as likely to be sexually harassed as women in blue collar jobs. False. Three, sexual harassment is not limited to physical contact. It can occur any time that an individual is uncomfortable with another person's advances, comments, or behaviors. True. Four, sexual harassment can occur outside of the work environment and still be considered work-related, such as that which happens at office parties and out-of-town seminars. True. Five, if the harasser meant it only as flirting or joking, it does not constitute sexual harassment. False. Six, quid pro quo harassment is a form of sexual harassment when there is a request or demand of sexual favors in exchange for employment benefits, such as promotions or threatening reprisals, if the favors are not given. True. Seven, in order for an incident to be classified as sexual harassment, the victim must be of the opposite sex of the harasser. False. Eight, 
friendly flirting is not sexual harassment. When flirting is practiced between mutually consenting individuals who are equal in power or authority. False. 9. Using terms of endearment with coworkers, such as honey, dear, sweetie, or baby, can be considered derogatory and a form of sexual harassment. True. 10. Retaliation is any type of adverse action taken against an employee that complains about harassment or a witness that participates in an investigation. True. Employees can help prevent workplace sexual harassment through simple common sense. Be respectful in your interactions with your fellow employees, including your interactions with subordinates. In other words, model appropriate behavior. When in doubt about whether your conduct constitutes sexual harassment, assume that it does. All employees have the right to work in a workplace free of sexual harassment, and with rights come responsibilities. It's everyone's responsibility to ensure that their behavior is above question and to act if someone is being harassed. Gender equality. Sex-based discrimination. Sex discrimination involves treating someone, an applicant or employee, unfavorably because of that person's sex. Discrimination against an individual because of gender identity, including transgender status, or because of sexual orientation, is discrimination. The law forbids discrimination when it comes to any aspect of employment, including hiring, firing, pay, job assignments, promotions, layoff, training, fringe benefits, and any other term or condition of employment. Sex discrimination harassment. It is unlawful to harass a person because of that person's sex. Harassment can include sexual harassment or unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. Harassment does not have to be of a sexual nature, however, and can include offensive remarks about a person's sex. For example, it is illegal to harass a woman by making offensive comments about women in general. Both victim and the harasser can be either a woman or a man, and the victim and harasser can be the same sex. Although the law doesn't prohibit simple teasing, offhand comments, or isolated incidents that are not very serious, harassment is illegal when it is so frequent or severe that it creates a hostile or offensive work environment, or when it results in an adverse employee decision, such as the victim being fired or demoted. The harasser can be the victim's supervisor, a supervisor in another area, a coworker, or someone who is not an employee of the employer, such as a client or a customer. Sex discrimination and employment policies slash practices. An employment policy or practice that applies to everyone, regardless of sex, can be illegal if it has a negative impact on the employment of people of a certain sex and is not job related or necessary to the operation of the business. EEOC interprets and enforces Title VII's prohibition of sex discrimination as forbidding any employment discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation. These protections apply regardless of any contrary state or local laws. Through investigation, conciliation, and litigation of charges by individuals against private sector employers, as well as hearings and appeals for federal sector workers, the Commission has taken the position that existing sex discrimination provisions in Title VII protect lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, LGBT applicants and employees against employment bias. Examples of LGBT-related sex discrimination claims. Some examples of LGBT-related claims that EEOC views as unlawful sex discrimination include failing to hire an applicant because she is a transgender woman, firing an employee because he is planning or has made a gender transition, denying an employee equal access to a common restroom corresponding to the employee's gender identity, harassing an employee because of a gender transition, such as by intentionally and persistently failing to use the name and gender pronoun that corresponds to the gender identity which with the employee identifies, and which the employee has communicated to management and employees, denying an employee a promotion because he is gay or straight, 
discriminating in terms, conditions, or privileges of employment, such as providing a lower salary to an employee because of sexual orientation, or denying spousal health insurance benefits to a female employee because her legal spouse is a woman, while providing spousal health insurance to a male employee whose legal spouse is a woman. Harassing an employee because of his or her sexual orientation, for example, by derogatory terms, sexually oriented comments, or disparaging remarks for associating with a person of the same or opposite sex. Discriminating against or harassing an employee because of his or her sexual orientation or gender identity in combination with another unlawful reason. For example, on the basis of transgender status and race, or sexual orientation and disability. What is workplace violence? Workplace violence describes violence or a threat of violence against workers. It can happen at or outside of the workplace. It varies from threats and verbal abuse to physical harm and homicide. It's one of the leading causes of job-related deaths. However it happens, workplace violence is a big concern for employers and employees across the country. Various actions in a work environment can cause workplace violence. For example, anger over punishment or getting fired, or a customer refusing to follow the rules of the business. It can also come from a non-work-related situation such as domestic violence, road rage, or hate crimes. A hate crime involves violence and intolerance against a person because of their race, country of origin, religion, sexual orientation, or a disability. Workplace violence can be caused by an abusive employee, manager, supervisor, co-worker, customer, family member, or stranger. Whatever or whoever the cause is, workplace violence is never accepted or tolerated. There is no foolproof way to predict someone's behavior. There might be warning signs, but there's no specific description of someone who might be dangerous. Violence and anger include verbal and emotional abuse or threats, and the physical attack to someone or property from another person or group. The effect of violence on a victim depends on the harshness of the act and the victim's experiences, skills, and personality. Violent acts include verbal abuse in person or on the phone, written abuse, harassment, threats, ganging up to bully or scare someone, physical or sexual attacks, armed robbery, harmful damage to property of staff, customers, or the business. Workplace violence may not always seem like an extreme situation from the beginning. It can sometimes follow a pattern of behavior that grows in its level of danger. It can start from distress, anger or frustration, and scary body language, and turn into verbal or written abuse and threats, physical threats and assault, i.e. an attack. There are two reasons for workplace violence. Material gain. This is when the offender wants money, drugs, or valuable goods and they use violence to get it. Non-material gain. This includes sexual attacks, taking hostages, and the incidental attack on people in a direct area in the workplace. Sometimes, unwelcome behavior appears as discrimination or verbal and sexual harassment. It could be from staff, clients, customers, or the public. While this behavior is inappropriate and stressful, they don't always come with anger and violence. Nonviolent discrimination or harassment should be dealt with as early as possible so they don't become more serious or lead to violent behavior. Workplace bullying is angry behavior that scares, embarrasses, and weakens a person or group. Bullying is the repeated, unfavorable treatment of a person by someone or a group of people in the workplace. It is always unreasonable and inappropriate. Examples of bullying at work include yelling, screaming, abusive language, always criticizing someone, isolating or ignoring a worker, and damaging someone's work or ability to do their job by not giving them important information, proper training, and resources. Bullying comes from someone or a group needing to have power or to show superiority over someone else. Sources of Workplace Violence Any one or a mixture of these situations could create workplace violence. Offenders might take money, drugs, or goods from a business or employee. Attacks can seem random but are usually planned. The offender knows your business has something they want. They will go where security and violence control measures aren't very good. Offenders may not be rational when they attack or could be drunk or on drugs. Some offenders could be interested in non-material gain. An example of that is sexual assault. Sex offenders may watch victims, plan the attack, or choose victims at random when they get the chance. Working alone, leaving work at night, and traveling home alone can be big risks. 
Extreme environments of workers being overloaded with work and overly pushed to perform by supervisors can also cause workplace violence. When people commit violent acts, it's not usually a unique situation. They may have a past of violent behavior. Clients may be unhappy with multiple parts of your business, like cost, performance of the product or service, treatment by staff, repeated delays, and inconveniences. These things don't excuse violence. They should be recognized as possible reasons for an offender's actions. Clients and their friends and relatives may take violent action on workers trying to help them. Sometimes, the event can happen in a single experience with a service. For example, a relative of a seriously hurt person trying to have them cared for at a hospital. In most cases, violence happens after a bunch of smaller conflicts over a period of time. Discrimination and harassment bullying is the need for personal gain and pleasure. It's said that violent acts are committed for their own needs with little to no plans. Random vandalism, destruction of property, is an example. Some robberies happen randomly, in the moment, brought on by opportunity. If there's no staff or valuables are left in an easy to reach place, offenders take what they want. Less common angry behaviors include making barricades and hostage taking. Clients whose minds are affected by drugs or alcohol or those going through withdrawals may be violent. It is possible to have a strategy to prevent this, as well as procedures to handle violent situations in case they happen. Incidental violence, like robbery or attacking someone in the workplace, can affect the staff. While some staff may not be physically attacked, they may suffer trauma from the side of it. You may not be able to stop these situations, but you could have procedures in place to minimize the damage. Who is vulnerable? About 2 million American workers are victims of this violence each year. Workplace violence can happen anywhere, and no one is an exception. The best protection employers can offer is to create a zero-tolerance policy about workplace violence against or by employees. The employer should have a workplace violence prevention program or add information to an existing program, employee handbook, or manual of standard operating procedure. It's important to ensure all employees know the policy and understand that claims of workplace violence will be investigated and dealt with immediately. Employers can also offer protections like the following. Providing safety education, like a course for employees to teach them what actions are unacceptable. They'll learn what to do if they witness or endure workplace violence and how to protect themselves. Securing the workplace. Depending on the business, you can install video surveillance, extra lighting, alarm systems, and cut down on outsiders through identification badges, electronic keys, and guards. Providing safes to limit the amount of cash on hand. Keep a small amount of cash in the registers in the evening and late night hours. Equipping staff with cell phones, handheld alarms, or noise devices. Require them to make a daily work plan and keep a contact person informed of their location through the day. Keeping employee vehicles properly maintained. Telling employees not to enter an unsafe location, bring in a buddy system, or provide police assistance in possibly dangerous situations or at night. Developing rules and processes to cover visits by home health care providers. Talk about the conduct of home visits, the presence of others in the home during visits, and the worker's right to refuse services in dangerous situations. Employers and Managers Employers and managers should know the effects of workplace violence dangers managers and supervisors are responsible for creating preventative tactics and consulting with employees, making sure preventative tactics are understood by employees, ensuring the tactics are monitored and working well. Employees Workplace violence dangers must be discussed with employees and they must know what's in place for their protection. They must be properly trained on the topic of the equipment, avoiding risks, and what to do if a workplace violence incident happens. Think of the needs of the employees who do not speak English and make sure they know the risks and chosen controls. Contractors, suppliers, customers, and visitors are people who work for you and enter your workplace, so they must be given the correct information about workplace violence procedures. Do this through signs or written and verbal actions. The risk assessment process decides the level of information given. You may have already taken action to cut down risks. It's important to know if your decisions still give effective safeguards to your employees before health and safety of anyone is at risk. Conduct a regular review of procedures involving people in your workplace who have responsibilities for health and safety. If work practices are changed or new practices and control tactics come up, 
review your preventative measures to ensure they are effective and safe and won't create new dangers. If you have new information about a danger that was overlooked, review your preventative tactics. If an accident, injury, incident, or a near miss in the workplace happens involving violence, review the procedures you have and make changes to prevent it from happening again. How can employees protect themselves? Nothing promises an employee that they won't become a victim of workplace violence. These steps can help reduce your chances. Learn to identify, avoid, or correct possible violent situations by taking personal safety training courses. Tell supervisors about concerns and safety or security. Report all incidents right away in writing. Avoid going to unfamiliar locations or situations alone whenever you can. Carry small amounts of money and required identification for community settings. What should employers do after an incident of workplace violence? Encourage employees to report and keep track of all incidents and threats involving workplace violence. Provide immediate medical assistance and treatment after an event. Report violent incidents to the local police right away. Let the victims know about their legal right to prosecute offenders. Discuss what happened with staff members. Give employees a chance to share information on ways to avoid a certain situation in the future. Offer stress interview sessions and post-traumatic counseling services to help workers heal after a violent incident. Investigate all violent incidents and threats, monitor patterns and violent incidents by type or circumstance, and take corrective actions. Discuss changes in the program during regular employee meetings. Help make the world a better place. Do your part to end violence in the workplace. Workplace harassment. Workplace harassment is a form of employment discrimination prohibited by a number of state and federal statutes. It is a pattern of physical or verbal conduct which a reasonable employee would regard as undesirable or offensive and which is both severe and extensive enough to actually interfere with the employee's work performance. Although your company has a policy prohibiting sexual harassment specifically, this is not the only type of prohibited harassment. Unlawful harassment prohibited your company strictly prohibits unlawful harassment against employees or any other persons based on their race, religion, creed, national origin, ancestry, sex, including pregnancy, gender, including gender nonconformity and status as a transgender or transsexual individual, age, physical or mental disability, citizenship, veteran status, genetic information, past, current, or prospective service in the uniformed services, or any other characteristic protected under applicable federal, state, or local law. This harassment is often similar to sexual harassment and includes verbal harassment, for example, nicknames, slurs that in any way relate to race, derogatory comments or jokes, intimidating, threatening, or profane language. Physical harassment, for example, pranks, practical jokes, other disorderly conduct, assault or inappropriate physical contact, threatening acts. Visual harassment, for example, displaying derogatory posters, cartoons, drawings, or making derogatory gestures. Online harassment, for example, derogatory statements or sexually suggestive postings in any social media platform including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. These are just some forms of harassment. Be advised that no form of harassment will be tolerated. Harassment is prohibited both at the workplace and at employer-sponsored events. This includes harassment outside the workplace that is brought into the workplace. Here's some examples. Javier, Susie, and Jane are all co-workers. Javier and Susie were out one day and saw Jane walking into a church. Later that night at work, Javier and Susie started teasing Jane about being a churchgoer and a Bible thumper. Is this harassment? Yes. Jane doesn't like to be teased about her religious beliefs. She needs to report the incident immediately to her supervisor. John's boyfriend Ben came into the restaurant with his family and requested to sit in John's section. Some of the staff were shocked because they didn't know John was gay. Later that night, someone left an obscene drawing of two men together on one of John's tables. Is this harassment? Yes. John should immediately take the drawing off the table to turn it into management for investigation. One of the managers was preparing the schedule for the week. Derek, a server, overheard the manager talking about another staff member. The manager said he didn't want to schedule Christy to work because she's so old. 
The manager joked that Christy may need a walker soon. Christy is 50. What should the server do? Derek should report the comments to another manager or human resources department. Even though Christy wasn't there to hear the comments, Derek did hear them. The comments were discriminatory and harassing based upon Christy's age. Lisa and Samantha get into an argument at work. After work, Lisa goes onto her personal social media pages and posts complaints about Samantha. She makes fun of Samantha by calling her names. Although Lisa doesn't use Samantha's real name, everyone in the workplace knows Lisa is talking about Samantha. Is this harassment? Yes, these kinds of comments on social media are considered harassment and cause an intimidating work environment. Comments about the workplace, coworkers, your boss, customers, or vendors should not be posted on social media. Samantha, or anyone else who viewed Lisa's posts, should report the incident to management immediately. What your company expects from you. Your company strives to create a fun and non-threatening work environment for all managers and employees. Issues such as harassment based on any of the above listed impermissible factors can detract from this positive experience and does not comply with the operating values and philosophy. Your company expects that you will not simply suffer through undesirable or offensive conduct in silence or permit other employees to suffer through such conduct without reporting it. Whether or not you are certain that another person's behavior actually constitutes harassment, it is your responsibility to report it directly to management as soon as possible after the incident occurs. Where the possibility of violence is an immediate concern, report to management at once. You should not be subjected to a threatening or violent individual. Further, your company specifically discourages you from engaging in any physical confrontation with a violent or potentially violent individual. If you are subjected to any conduct that you believe violates the anti-harassment policy or witness any such conduct, you are required to promptly report it to your direct supervisor or, if the conduct involves your direct supervisor, report to the Human Resources Department. Your complaint should be as detailed as possible, including the names of all individuals involved and any witnesses. You must report any incidents you believe may constitute harassment based on sex, race, color, national origin, ethnicity, religion, age, disability, veteran status, or other category protected by law. Additionally, any manager or supervisor who observes harassing conduct is required to report the conduct to the Human Resources Department so that an investigation can be made and corrective action taken, if appropriate. No retaliation. The company strictly prohibits any form of discipline, reprimand, intimidation, or retaliation for good faith reporting of incidents of harassment of any kind, pursuing any harassment claim, or cooperating in related investigations. For more information on your company's policy prohibiting harassment or retaliation, please refer to its policies and procedures or contact the Human Resources Department. Workplace Bullying Workplace bullying refers to repeated, unreasonable actions of people directed towards an employee, which is intended to intimidate and creates a risk to the health and safety of the employee. Workplace bullying often involves an abuse or misuse of power. It includes behavior that is intimidating, degrading, offending, and humiliating, and usually happens in front of others. Bullying behavior creates feelings of defenselessness and negatively affects employees' confidence and impacts their performance. Bullying is different from aggression. Whereas aggression may involve a single act, bullying involves repeated attacks against a person, creating an ongoing pattern of behavior. Tough or demanding bosses are not necessarily bullies, as long as their primary motivation is to obtain the best performance by setting high expectations. Many bullying situations involve employees bullying their peers rather than a supervisor bullying an employee. Examples of bullying Unwarranted or invalid criticism Wrongful blame for situations Being treated differently than the rest of the work group Being sworn at Exclusion or social isolation Being shouted at or being humiliated Being the target of practical jokes Excessive monitoring What is a workplace bully? On its surface, bullying is a simple concept. A strong person acts harshly towards someone they perceive as weaker, smaller, or in some way vulnerable. A bully's behavior is blatant and persistent. It includes intimidating and threatening someone through verbal usage and yelling. This behavior makes the subject of the bullying feel embarrassed, ashamed, and useless. Accidental versus intentional bullying. 
not everyone who displays bullying behaviors can truly be described as a workplace bully. Someone may have genuine concern for your well-being and attempt to influence your behavior for your own good. Just because you don't like their approach doesn't make them a bully. Or people may yell at you in frustration. They may just lack emotional maturity and are overreacting to a stressful situation. An isolated incident doesn't prove bullying. Good-hearted people often make mistakes. In contrast, workplace bullies have self-serving goals and a complete lack of respect or caring for others. They don't consider their co-workers as equals, but people beneath them. Bullies will feel free to use any means necessary to get what they want. They want to dominate those that they consider being weak, naive, unaware, or otherwise susceptible to his abuse. What can be done about bullying? Bullying in general is not illegal in the U.S. unless it involves harassment based on race or color, creed, religion, national origin, sex, age, disability, HIV or AIDS, or hepatitis C status. Here is what you can do about bullying. Regain control by recognizing that you are being bullied, realizing that you are not the source of the problem, and recognizing that bullying is about control and therefore has nothing to do with you or your work. Take action by keeping a diary detailing the nature of the bullying, for example, dates, times, places, what was said or done, and who was present. Obtaining copies of harassing or bullying paper trails. Hold on to copies of documents that contradict the bully's accusations against you, for example, timesheets, audit reports, etc. Report all incidents to a supervisor or human resource department. Other actions. Expect the bully to deny and perhaps twist your accusations and use them against you. Make sure you have a witness with you during any meetings with the bully and always report the behavior to the appropriate person. Workplace Social Media Guidelines Social media is a prevalent source of social interaction in today's society. While social media can be useful, entertaining, and educational, Sometimes the communication you post can negatively impact you and or the company you work for. Using social media at work. Refrain from using social media while on work time or on equipment the company provides, unless it is work-related as authorized by your manager. Do not use your company email address to register on social networks, blogs, or other online tools utilized for personal use. When using social media outside of work, Post only appropriate and respectful content. Maintain the confidentiality of your employer's trade secrets and private or confidential information. Trade secrets may include information regarding the development of systems, processes, products, know-how, and technology. Do not post internal reports, policies, procedures, or other internal business-related confidential communications. Respect financial disclosure laws. It is illegal to communicate or give a tip on inside information to others so that they may buy or sell stocks or securities. Such online conduct may also violate the insider trading policy. Avoid any defamatory, offensive, or derogatory content. It may be considered a violation of the company's anti-harassment policy if directed towards colleagues, clients, or partners. Do not create a link from your blog, website, or other social networking site to your employer's website without getting permission. Express only your personal opinions. Never represent yourself as a spokesperson for the company. If your company is a subject of the content you are creating, be clear and open about the fact that you are an associate and make it clear that your views do not represent those of the company, fellow associates, members, customers, suppliers, or people working on behalf of the company. If you do publish a blog or post online related to the work you do or people associated with your company, make it clear that you are not speaking on behalf of the company. It is best to include a disclaimer such as, the postings on this site are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the company. Check your company's social media policy to determine whether there are additional guidelines you must follow while using social media platforms. If you have any questions, ask your manager on duty. Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. The ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in employment, state and local government, public accommodations, commercial facilities, transportation, and telecommunications. It also applies to the United States Congress. 
To be protected by the ADA, one must have a disability or have a relationship or association with an individual with a disability. An individual with a disability is defined by the ADA as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, a person who has a history or record of such an impairment, or a person who is perceived by others as having such an impairment. The ADA does not specifically name all of the impairments that are covered. ADA Title I – Employment Title I requires employers with 15 or more employees to provide qualified individuals with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from the full range of employment-related opportunities available to others. For example, it prohibits discrimination in recruitment, hiring, promotions, training, pay, social activities, and other privileges of employment. It restricts questions that can be asked about an applicant's disability before a job offer is made, and it requires that employers make reasonable accommodations to the known physical or mental limitations of otherwise qualified individuals with disabilities, unless it results in undue hardship. Religious entities with 15 or more employees are covered under Title I. ADA Title II – State and Local Government Activities Title II covers all activities of state and local governments regardless of the government entity's size or receipt of federal funding. Title II requires that state and local governments give people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from all of their programs, services, and activities. For example, public education, employment, transportation, recreation, health care, social services, courts, voting, and town meetings. State and local governments are required to follow specific architectural standards in the new construction and alteration of their buildings. They also must relocate programs or otherwise provide access in inaccessible older buildings and communicate effectively with people who have hearing, vision, or speech disabilities. Public entities are not required to take actions that would result in undue financial and administrative burdens. They are required to make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures where necessary to avoid discrimination unless they can demonstrate that doing so would fundamentally alter the nature of their service, program, or activity being provided. ADA Title III – Public Accommodations Title III covers businesses and nonprofit service providers that are public accommodations, privately operated entities offering certain types of courses and examinations, privately operated transportation, and commercial facilities. Public accommodations are private entities who own, lease, lease to, or operate facilities such as restaurants, retail stores, hotels, movie theaters, private schools, convention centers, doctor's offices, homeless shelters, transportation depots, zoos, federal homes, daycare centers, and recreation facilities including sports stadiums and fitness clubs. Transportation services provided by private entities are also covered by Title III. Public accommodations must comply with basic non-discrimination requirements that prohibit exclusion, segregation, and unequal treatment. They also must comply with specific requirements related to architectural standards for new and altered buildings. Reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures, effective communication with people with hearing, vision, and speech disabilities, and other access requirements. Additionally, public accommodations must remove barriers in existing buildings where it is easy to do so without much difficulty or expense, given the public accommodations resources. Courses and examinations related to professional, educational, or trade-related applications, licensing, certifications, or credentialing must be provided in a place and manner accessible to people with disabilities, or alternative accessible arrangements must be offered. Commercial facilities, such as factories and warehouses, must comply with the ADA's architectural standards for new construction and alterations. This course provides a basic overview of the first three sections of federal civil rights laws. The goal is to ensure equal opportunity for people with disabilities. To find out more about how these laws or any not covered in this course may apply to you, contact the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Conflict Resolution in any relationship, conflict is normal and sometimes healthy. No two people are going to agree on everything without ever disagreeing. Since relationship conflicts are always bound to happen, learning to handle them in a healthy way is very important. When conflict is dealt with poorly, it can badly hurt the relationship. On the flip side, when it's handled with respect and positivity, a conflict can turn into a chance to grow and improve the bond between two people. 
By learning the skills you need for proper conflict resolution, your personal and professional relationship will stay strong and continue to grow. The Fundamentals The main reason for conflict is differences between people. It happens when people disagree on their values, motivations, perceptions, ideas or desires or needs. Sometimes these differences seem unimportant. But when conflicts bring up strong feelings, a deep need related to the relationship is the source of the problem. This is a need to feel safe, secure, respected, valued, or a need for more closeness and intimacy in a relationship. Recognizing and resolving conflicting needs. If you don't understand what you're feeling, or you're only paying attention to certain emotions, you won't be able to figure out what you need. When you don't look deeper at your needs and feelings, you'll find it hard to communicate with others and discover what's really on your mind, making you upset. For example, couples usually argue about minor differences. These things include how a towel is hung up or the way someone does their hair. These issues are not the main problem, and what's really bothering someone stays hidden. In personal relationships, not understanding different needs can cause distance, arguments, and breakups. In the workplace, different needs are also the center of nasty arguments. When you identify the validity of conflicting needs and look at them under a microscope with care and understanding, you'll open yourself up to creative problem solving, team building, and better relationships. When you correct conflict and disagreements fast and smoothly, you'll gain a stronger sense of trust. Successful conflict resolution depends on your ability to manage stress while being calm and paying attention. When you're calm, you can properly read and understand verbal and nonverbal communication. Control your emotions and actions. If you can control your emotions, you won't need to communicate with threats, fear, or punishing people. Pay attention to how people are expressing feelings as well as their words. Be aware of your differences and respect them. Getting rid of disrespectful words and actions when you're having a conversation can help solve the problem faster. Healthy and unhealthy ways of managing and resolving conflict. Conflict brings on strong emotions which can lead to hurt feelings, disappointment, and uncomfortable situations. When dealt with in an unhealthy way, it can cause problems that can't be repaired, resentments, and breakups. If conflict is corrected in healthy ways, it improves our understanding of other people, builds trust, and strengthens our bonds in the relationship. Unhealthy responses to conflict are characterized by not being able to notice and react to important issues for another person, having explosive, angry, hurtful, and resentful reactions, holding back love, which creates rejection, isolation, shame, and fear of abandonment, expecting bad results, the fear and avoidance of conflict. Healthy responses to conflict are characterized by being able to notice and react to important issues, being willing to forgive and forget, looking for compromise wherever possible and avoiding punishment, believing that a solution can support the interests and needs of everyone involved, Four Key Conflict Resolution Skills Being able to succeed in managing and resolving problems revolves around four main skills. These skills form a fifth skill as a whole, which is greater than each individual skill. Combining these skills helps you understand how to take conflict as it comes and not create more problems than needed. You'll be able to resolve differences in ways that create trust and confidence. Quickly relieve stress. The ability to stay relaxed and focused in stressful situations is a crucial aspect of conflict resolution. If you can't stay centered and control your emotions, you might be emotionally overwhelmed in challenging situations. To quickly and reliably reduce stress, you must use your senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Everyone responds differently when focusing on their senses, so you need to figure out what will soothe you the best. 
Recognize and manage your emotions. Emotional awareness is important when trying to understand yourself and others. If you don't know how or why you feel a certain way, you won't be able to communicate properly or resolve disagreements easily. You'd think knowing your feelings would be simple, but many people ignore and push down strong emotions like anger, sadness, and fear. Your ability to deal with conflict relies on your connection to those feelings. If you fear these strong emotions or try to find solutions not based on emotion, your abilities to face and resolve differences will fall short. Improve your nonverbal communication skills. The most important information displayed during a conflict or argument is often nonverbal, actions without words. Nonverbal communication involves eye contact, facial expressions, tone of voice, the way you stand, touch, and gestures. During a conflict, pay attention to the other person's nonverbal signals. This can help you figure out what the person is really saying, and you can respond in a way that builds trust and helps discover the root of the problem. Simple nonverbal signals, like a calm tone of voice, a gentle touch, or a concerned expression can go far in softening the blow of an argument. When it's right, use humor and play to handle challenges. If you communicate in playful and funny ways, you can avoid many kinds of confrontations and resolve arguments faster. Humor can be an easier way to say something that's usually a difficult topic. It's important to note that you should laugh with the other person, not at them. Humor and play should be used to reduce tension, help you look at the problem in a new way, and put everything in perspective. Then, the conflict can become a chance to build a stronger connection and intimacy in personal relationships. Tips for Managing and Resolving Conflict The key to managing and resolving conflict is emotional maturity, self-control, and empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. These concepts can be challenging, frustrating, and scary. There are ways to make sure the conflict becomes a positive experience by following the conflict resolution guidelines. The relationship is your priority. Make an effort to keep the relationship strong instead of focusing on winning the argument. Respect the other person and their point of view. Focus on the present. Don't bring up past arguments because your ability to be objective about the current argument will negatively be affected if you do. Instead of bringing up the past and placing blame, think about what you can do right now to solve the current problem. Pick your battles. Conflicts take a lot of energy, so it's important to think about if the issue is worth fighting about. For example, if you've been waiting for a specific parking spot for a long time and someone takes it from you, go find another one. This fight isn't worth your time when there are plenty of other spots. Be willing to forgive. Resolving conflict is impossible if you can't or won't consider forgiveness. Resolution comes from the willingness to let go of the thought of punishment. Punishment will never make up for a loss and only adds to an injury by putting more strain on our lives. Know when to let go. If you can't agree and never will, agree to disagree. It takes two people to argue. So if an argument is going nowhere, make the choice to walk away. Fair fighting, ground rules. Stay calm, don't overreact to difficult situations. If you stay calm, people will be more willing to listen to you and consider your views. Express feelings in words, not actions. Being direct and honest about your feelings is a powerful form of communication. If you feel angry or upset and might lose control, consider taking a step back until you're ready to return to the conversation with a peaceful mindset. Be specific about what's wrong. Vague comments don't lead to resolution. Handle one issue at a time. Take your time and don't bring in new issues until the previous ones have been discussed completely. This will help you avoid juggling several complaints at once with nothing getting solved. Never attack people about things that are extremely personal and sensitive. This creates distrust, anger, and vulnerability. Avoid accusations because that will lead to defensiveness. Instead, talk about how someone's actions made you feel. 
Focus on your own feelings, which you know are true. Don't generalize, especially with words like never or always, because the generalization will increase tension and are usually inaccurate and unfair. Never invent complaints or feelings about the situation that will stop the real issues from coming out. Stick to the facts and be completely honest about your feelings. Don't let your complaints or hurt feelings build up over time. Deal with issues as they happen, because it'll be impossible to handle an explosion of old problems in one conversation. Everyone sees situations differently, and they may not realize that they created a problem for you until you point it out. Managing and resolving conflict by learning how to listen. When people are extremely upset, their words don't always show the real issues and needs about the main problem. This is where we need to listen and watch more closely to reveal what's being felt. Then, we can connect deeply with our own needs and emotions and those of other people. Listening like this strengthens, informs, and makes it easier for others to interact with us. Listen carefully to the reasons why people are upset. Ask questions if you don't understand what someone is telling you and understand their views. Repeat the person's words to ensure you understand them completely. Ask if there's anything else that needs to be said and give the person plenty of time to think before they answer. Stop yourself from speaking your opinions before the other person has had a chance to finish. Ensure they've said everything they need to and that they feel heard and their message is understood. When listening to a person's views, the following responses are helpful. Encourage the person to share their concerns in as much detail as possible. You can say, I want to understand what upset you. I want to know what you're hoping for. Clarify the major issues. Instead of making incorrect guesses, ask questions that let you gain information and let the other person know you're trying to understand. Can you say more about that? Repeat what you heard so you know you've understood so far. That can help the other person figure out if they need to say more. It sounds like you weren't expecting that to happen. Show your feelings and be as clear as possible. I can imagine how upsetting that was. Validate the concerns of the person, even if a solution is uncertain at the time. Expressing appreciation can be powerful if it's displayed with integrity and respect. I really appreciate that we can talk about this. Discipline without punishment. We are all responsible adults and can manage ourselves to be positive and highly productive team members. Our new discipline process has been developed to be more positive and places the responsibility of correcting disciplinary issues on the team member, not the manager. Disciplinary issues fall into one of three categories, attendance, performance, or conduct and behavior. Discipline without punishment is broken up into three different steps. Step number one, informal transactions that are positive in nature. Three parts. Number one, positive contacts. This is informal recognition done by all members of management. These are regular ongoing elements of any supervisor's job. Recognizing good performance through positive reinforcement. If a person does something and discovers that the result or consequence is positive, pleasant, rewarding, desirable, the person is likely to do it again. If a person does something and discovers the consequence is negative, unpleasant, distasteful, punishing, the person will quickly stop doing that thing. If a person does something and discovers there are no consequences, nothing positive or negative happens, that person will eventually stop doing that thing. When is recognition appropriate? When a team member does something that goes above and beyond the call of duty. When a team member has significantly improved his or her performance. The team member hasn't done anything particularly special or outstanding. They've simply been a solid performer, meeting all of the company's expectations over a long period of time. Look to things like attendance to see if there's an opportunity to recognize for above average attendance. Guidelines for effective recognition. Do it often and as soon as possible after a qualifying event. 
Tailor recognition, positive contact to the person, public versus private depending on the team member's preference. Be proportionate. Balance is vital. Think small. Don't wait until a team member has performed perfectly to provide recognition. Recognition tools that have provided great success to managers. Assign the team member a more desirable job or project. Give the team member an advanced copy of a new company brochure or advertisement. Buy her a cup of coffee or take her to lunch. Introduce him to a visitor and explain how his work contributes to the success of the department as a whole. Performance Improvement Discussions Types of Problems All problems of human performance fall into one of three categories. Attendance, Performance, Behavior, or Conduct. First, to start the problem-solving process, sort the problem you have with a team member into one of the three categories. Second, realize that each of the categories are mutually exclusive. You can have a performance issue without an attendance issue. What about attitude? It falls into the behavior and conduct category. Making problem definitions specific. Generalizations are not helpful in getting team members to understand the exact gap between actual performance and desired performance. To overcome generalizing or being judgmental, ask the question, what do I know for sure? Examples of actual performance concerns. A team member works on low-priority job tasks when she could be assisting others with much more important parts of their job. A team member does only those tasks that are specifically assigned. The team member says, I don't need anyone's help when the manager asks a fellow team member to work with her on a minor project. Examples of desired performance. Team members demonstrate a spirit of cooperation, as shown by not monopolizing time during a team meeting. The team member assists others when they ask for help or politely explains why she can't at that time. A team member asks coworkers for assistance in her projects to demonstrate that others are also members of the team. Determining the cause. Once the gap between desired and actual performance has been clearly identified, the next step is to determine why the team member isn't doing the job properly. The easiest way to determine the actual cause is to ask the question, could he do the job properly if his life depended on it? If the answer is no, we're probably looking at a deficiency in knowledge. Some kind of training is probably required. If the answer is yes, we're dealing with a deficiency in execution. Remove obstacles, provide feedback, and arrange appropriate consequences. The goal of a performance improvement conversation is to get the team member to agree to solve a concern or problem they're causing and to return to a fully acceptable performance so the employment relationship can be saved. By getting the team member's agreement to correct the situation, the odds that an actual correction will result increase. If the problem continues, the next discussion will concentrate on the continuing problem, but also on the team member's failure to live up to the agreement they previously made. Before scheduling the discussion, it's important to fully prepare using the manager's Discipline Without Punishment Preparation Tool. This tool will help you anticipate any questions or difficulties that may arise. You should also take the time to discuss the issue with another member of management or HR prior to sitting down with a team member. To be fully prepared, write a short summary of the essential information needed in the meeting. The statements should be brief and to the point. Basic Issue Overall Concern A short summary can be written under the Overall Concern area. Be sure to include specific statements of actual performance and desired performance. This is the most important part of the written summary. Write in simple, clear, and unarguable terms exactly what the performance expectation is and how the team member is failing to meet that expectation. Examples Attendance The desired performance is for the team member to arrive at work on time every day. The actual performance is that on May 5th, 11th, 22nd, and 26th, Joe reported for work more than 20 minutes late. Behavior or conduct 
The desired performance is that the team member speaks to and treats other team members with the same level of respect as the manager or guests. The actual performance is that the team member speaks down to other team members. Impact. A summary of the good business reasons why the problem needs to be solved. Making a list of the effects of the problem helps the team member understand why what he is doing is a problem. It also helps to get the agreement of the team member to solve the problem. Make a list of three to six good business reasons why a problem must be solved. Consider the impact of the situation on fellow team members, guests, the culture of the company, the perceptions of others, and the effects on the manager. Likely consequences. One consequence that will always appear on the list will be further disciplinary action up to and including discharge. Team members may not always look at this as a serious consequence. They may feel it more of a threat than the manager actually following through with it. If you have a difficult team member who refuses to correct an issue once it's been brought to their attention, the likely outcomes are being denied a salary increase, promotional opportunity, being subjected to closer supervision, and assigned to less desirable tasks. Five classic questions. Lastly, answering the five classic questions will determine if you can proceed with the disciplinary discussion. If you answer no to any one or more of these questions, the disciplinary action may not be justified. Reviewing these questions and getting affirmative answers to each one assures that you're on solid ground in taking the action you have planned. Even more importantly, if we are ever challenged and we can demonstrate that all managers use these criteria before taking action, our defensibility of whatever action is taken greatly increases. These are the five classic questions a manager should ask before he or she can legitimately say, I've done everything possible to support this team member. Number one, clarify expectations. A, can the team member explain what's expected of them? B, does the team member understand the difference between desired performance and actual performance? Number two, provide training. A. Does the team member have the knowledge and skills needed to do the job? B. Has the team member received the necessary training? Number three, arrange appropriate consequences. A. What happens to the team member when he or she performs properly? What happens to the team member when he or she does not perform properly? B. Does doing the job incorrectly produce unpleasant consequences? Number four, provide feedback. A. How does the team member know what's expected? B. How does the team member know how well or how poorly he or she is doing? Number five, remove obstacles. A. Is the team member receiving conflicting messages or instructions? B. Does the team member have the time, the tools, the equipment, the authority, and the support necessary to do the job correctly? After satisfactorily answering these questions, the manager will have met his or her responsibility to the team member. The burden now shifts to the team member, and the manager no longer has to wrestle with, was there anything else I could have or should have done? Performance Improvement Discussion Number 1 Informal counseling done by management after discussing the situation with the next level of management and the HR department. The manager makes a note of the date and the subject of the discussion. If the situation does not improve, the manager has another performance improvement discussion. Performance improvement discussion number two. Informal counseling done by management after discussing the situation with the next level of management and the HR department. The manager makes a note of the date and the subject of the discussion. This must be for the same reason the first performance improvement discussion occurred. If another occurrence takes place, the next step is a formal reminder of the first discussion. Any informal counseling subject that involves the safety of guests and team members may remain in the file permanently. Step number two, formal serious transactions, three parts. Reminders, what is a reminder? Instead of being reprimanded for what he or she had done or warned about what would happen the next time he or she transgressed, the individual is now reminded of two things. 
Number one, the company's expectations. The regional manager again reviews the performance expectations or job standard that the individual was failing to meet. If the issue is one of attendance, they go over his or her attendance record and the company's expectation that every team member show up every day they are scheduled. If the issue deals with a conduct of behavior issue, the regional manager explains exactly why it's important that the rule he or she is violated must be followed. If his or her performance is the issue, the regional manager describes exactly what's expected in quality and quantity of work. Number two, the team member's personal responsibility. Besides reminding the team member of exactly what performance is expected, the regional manager also reminds the individual of something equally important, that it is he or she who is responsible for meeting the company's standards. He or she is told in a friendly and supportive but also serious and business-like way that the company has delivered on its share of the bargain by giving him or her a good job at excellent pay together with the tools, training, and support required to do it well. Now he or she has to live up to his or her responsibility by actually doing what's expected and doing it well. The purpose of the regional manager's discussion is not to deliver a reprimand or warning. Instead, it's to make sure that the team member fully understands what's expected and that it's his or her responsibility to deliver. Number one, reminder one. Formal discipline delivered by mid-level management, regional manager or department manager or above after discussing with the HR department. Documentation is retained in the team member's employment file on active status for one year. If the situation doesn't correct itself, management moves to reminder number two. Two, reminder number two. Formal discipline delivered by mid-level management, regional manager or department manager, or above after discussing with the HR department. Documentation is retained in the team member's employment file on active status for one year. If the situation doesn't correct itself, management moves to the decision-making leave only after consulting with the HR director. Three, decision-making leave. Formal discipline of one day off with pay delivered by mid-level management, regional manager or department manager or above after discussing it with senior management and the HR director. A witness of supervisory level needs to be present. Documentation is retained in the team member's employment file on active status for one year. If the team member does not follow through with their agreement to get on board, the next step is termination. Why a decision-making leave? It allows us to demonstrate good faith. It transforms anger into guilt. It eliminates the need to save face. It makes it easier for the regional manager. It reduces hostility and the risk of workplace violence. It increases defensibility if the team member is later terminated. It removes money as an issue. It's consistent with our service standards. Since the above disciplinary transactions impact overall performance review ratings and the ability for adjustments in compensation, no salary increases will be approved for team members on active discipline. If a team member is on active discipline, the highest performance rating achievable is satisfactory. All documents remain in file permanently. Step 3. Termination Termination is not part of the disciplinary process. At the point of termination, the employee has chosen not to be on board with the company's policies and procedures. There's no discipline needed. It's a parting of company where all parties are treated with dignity and respect. There will be some infractions that will remain terminable offenses, theft, harassment, etc. At this point, the severity of the infraction requires involvement of the regional manager, general manager, and human resources. In applicable situations, a safety and security investigator may be involved. At any point in the process, the team member may use the communication process in the team member manual or contact the company ombudsperson to ask for advice or discuss concerns they have. When can steps be skipped? 
When a team member commits a serious disciplinary infraction, can early steps be skipped and a reminder to or decision-making leave step be taken directly? What are the situations that justify termination for a first defense? Level 1 problems, minor, do not involve honesty or trust and do not constitute a threat to the operation of the business. They pose no threat to the safety of team members. Example, excessive tardiness, basic performance issues, and service standard issues. Level 2 problems, serious, have some degree of threat to the operation of the business or to the safety of the team members. Examples, showing up for work unfit for duty, being absent without notification, advanced performance issues, and service standard issues. Level 3 problems, major, seriously threaten the operation of the business or the safety of team members, or demonstrate in and of themselves that the offender has so little personal integrity and self-esteem that his continued presence cannot be tolerated. Examples, deliberate falsification of records, theft and fraud, assaulting a supervisor, team member or guest, etc. Discharge is appropriate at this level. You will rarely terminate at the time of incident. The guideline should be to suspend pending investigation. This is considered a crisis suspension and is done without pay. Upon employee's return, terminate. Dealing with discussion difficulties. The yeah, but game. When you hear yeah, but, recognize you're being sucked into a communication game that you will not win. Agree with the objection and turn the responsibility back where it belongs with the team member. Example, manager, you're right, Sally. I agree that is a real problem. It would be difficult for me too. How are you planning to handle the situation moving forward so you can meet your responsibility of being here every day? When Sally says, gee, I don't know, the appropriate response could be, well, Sally, you need to think about that carefully because I need someone in this position who can be here every day, and I sure hope that person is you. The silence game. This happens when the team member chooses not to respond to the manager's attempts to discuss the problem. This silent reaction could stem from apprehension or anxiety. Sometimes it's used in an attempt to intimidate you. There's no reason for a manager to be intimidated. If silence continues, tell the team member you have no choice but to discontinue the meeting and make a decision on discipline based on the evidence on hand. Consult with human resources for further assistance if necessary. The I'll try game. Trying doesn't count. Only doing what you're paid to do counts. Follow up the statement with, I'm glad to hear you'll try, but what will you actually do to make sure you'll be successful? The irrelevancy game. Dismiss the irrelevant topic raised by the team member and redirect the conversation to your subject. Closing the discussion. If the conversation is a performance improvement discussion, simply thank the team member for agreeing to correct the situation and express your confidence that the two of you will not need to talk about the matter again. If the conversation is a formal disciplinary matter, two additional steps must be taken. Inform the team member that the conversation is a formal disciplinary transaction. Inform the team member which step in the Discipline Without Punishment program is being taken. Solving Attendance and Attitude Problems Attendance. Remember the cause of any absence is irrelevant. Only the fact they are not here counts. What do you know for sure? When the business opened, the team member wasn't there and his or her job didn't get done. Attendance Policy. This company expects staff to show up on time every day as scheduled, fully prepared, in appropriate attire, clean, straight, and sober for the entire duration of the workday. Any variation from that is a failure to meet expectations and is a violation of policy. The sick leave misunderstanding. Sick leave has nothing to do with attendance. Sick leave exists to cover wages for days you are unable to come in due to long-term ailments. Never call it excessive absenteeism because using that term suggests some amount of absenteeism is okay. 
be aware of FMLA and the ADA and the impact on illnesses. Actions to prevent liability with FMLA and ADA. Contact the HR department to discuss specific medical problems with team members. Do not encourage team members to discuss their issues openly with other store employees. Gather as much information as possible and consult the HR team for a plan going forward. Attitude problems. When you need to confront someone who is in need of an attitude adjustment, never use the word attitude. It's unproductive. Narrow the problem down to specifics. What exactly is the team member doing? Is he or she egotistical or taking credit when it's not due? Does he or she spend too much time socializing? Does he or she engage in pouting or sulking when he or she doesn't get his or her way? Is he or she rude, surly, or inconsiderate? Write down the actual verbal and physical behaviors and actions that concern you, the evidence that the team member is behaving in an unacceptable way. Be sure to record nonverbal cues too, such as rolling eyes, arms crossed tightly across chest, etc. Write down the impact of the specific inappropriate behavior, in effect, unharmonious atmosphere in the workplace, lack of teamwork, etc. What are the good business reasons the company expects team members to conduct themselves in the service excellence philosophy? How is the team member acting right now that may produce an adverse climate for other team members and guests? What effect does his or her negative behavior have on coworkers and guests? Find a private place to talk, discuss the situation with the team member, and explain that his or her behavior, not his attitude, is causing a problem. Start off with the familiar, we have a problem and I need your help. Talk about all of your concerns and why they concern you. Don't expect to get any useful responses and wrap up the discussion by saying, that's great, Jack or Jill. I'm glad you feel there's nothing to it. Let's get back together in a week or so to ensure that the problem is solved. A week later, if there hasn't been a turnaround, talk again. Keeping notes summarizing your interactions will help in the disciplinary process. If a third conversation is necessary, raise the stakes. Have the discussion again and explain bluntly that the team member only has the choice to correct the behavior if he wants to keep his job. The performance review can be a powerful tool in bringing about a change, particularly if it's not time for a review. You can deliver it early and indicate what the team member's review would look like at the current time. Inform the team member that if there is not a dramatic and sustained change in his or her interactions with coworkers and or guests immediately, we may decide to move in a different direction going forward. If all else fails, then proceed forward to formal discipline. Diversity in the workplace. What does diversity mean? It means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing individual differences. These differences can include race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs, or other ideologies. Why is diversity important to us? Our company's success relies on our ability to understand, communicate, and effectively interact with different cultural and generational backgrounds in the workplace. Diverse perspectives, experiences, and skill sets are invaluable to the growth and success of our organization. Our goal is to create an environment of acceptance and equal opportunity for everyone. Cultural and Generational Differences People with diverse cultural or generational backgrounds operate differently in the workplace. It's important to know the differences to understand each other. Some of the differences are Individual versus teamwork orientation Visual versus oral learning style Expressive versus introverted behavior Physical versus non-physical. Emotional versus reserved personality. 
Assertive versus acquiescent behavior. Outgoing versus quiet. Work versus family focus. Divergent or convergent thinking. Long-term versus short-term career planning. The do's of practicing successful diversity in the workplace. Do respect others' opinions. Do acknowledge cultural and generational differences and historical injustices without becoming defensive. Do be open to learning about other cultures and ideas. Do give others the benefit of doubt in a dispute. Do seek first to understand others' point of views, then to be understood. The don'ts of diversity. Don't stereotype. Don't judge others by your own cultural standards. Don't assume your culture's way is the only way. Don't talk down to anyone. Communicate effectively. One of the most important aspects of understanding diversity is communication. Without proper communication, people feel misunderstood, ignored, or frustrated. Blocks to effective communication can be irrational assumptions, misunderstanding, prejudice, fear. Irrational assumptions. An irrational assumption is a belief that is founded on baseless opinions, often skewed by bias. One of the best examples of irrational assumptions are the stereotypes we formulate about people based on their association or membership with cultural or ethnic groups. Misunderstanding. Misunderstandings are a normal part of communication, either because we unintentionally or intentionally use the wrong words, or because we don't understand what is being said to us. To prevent misunderstanding, know who you're talking to, be respectful, and be sure of what you want to say. Prejudice. By definition, prejudice is either a bias in favor of or against something. Such biases can of course be benign. However, those preferences having to do with people can be hurtful and cause problems, especially in the workplace. Fear. Fear of change in the workplace is counterproductive, especially fear of ideas and people who are different from us. In order to overcome these blocks to communication, it's important to have an open dialogue with others. An open dialogue means talking and listening. Listen. In order to understand the other's point of view, seek first to understand by listening. Talk. Speak calmly and respectfully in order to communicate your position. This open dialogue will help you arrive at an understanding that serves common goals. Remember, you don't always have to agree with one another, but you do have to respect each other and your differences of opinion. How can you, as an employee, promote diversity? Practice positive, constructive work habits in the workplace. Work cooperatively towards a common goal. Contribute to your fullest potential. Strive for excellence. Recognize and respect others and their individuality. Think before you speak and be sensitive to others. Talk about your differences and ask tactful questions about how people want to be treated. Eliminate stereotypes and generalizations. Handling diversity problems. If you witness or are subjected to any discriminatory practices based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs, or other ideologies, please report to your supervisor or human resources department immediately.